research firm Gartner Incorporated forecasts that end-user spending on wearable devices will hit a new high worldwide. Over $81.5 billion in 2021, up 18% from 2020. The Wireless Communications Alliance and Volmer Systems presents a webinar on wireless AR and VR. We look beyond the world of consumer products to the future of wearable technologies, using this tech in the workplace. Using virtual and augmented reality, new applications are emerging. They drive productivity for a range of industries, from medical professionals to engineers and manufacturers. Providing new solutions for everything from task tracking at a construction site to helping a doctor remotely assess a patient. The lineup includes leading experts in the Internet of Things, AR VR, and the public cloud. Click the link below and sign up for this important free event. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for taking time in your evening for our East Coast friends and your afternoon here in the West and Central. Uh, appreciate you being here to learn uh, what there is to learn about wearables and IoT and AR and VR, all the buzzwords that seem to um, uh, resonate these days um, in technology. And I'm really excited to have uh, be a representative here at the WCA as a board member to lead the IoT application series on this topic. So before we get started, let uh, me hand it over to Jeremy Toll, um, our WCA board member, uh, who can tell you a little bit more about the organization, and then uh, we can kind of get started. And uh, I encourage everyone to ask questions in the chat room while um, we proceed. So thank you very much. Jeremy, to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I'm Jeremy Toll. I'm the board member and vice president of the Wireless Communication Alliance. Um, this is a great series that Andy's come up with, um, talking about wearables in the AR, VR world. So the WCA has been around since 1994. We're a nonprofit business league dedicated to collaboration in the wireless industry worldwide. We've been bringing you uh, um, wireless uh, well webinar events for the last year plus um, through the pandemic, but we, we've done a bunch of uh, in-person events as well. And we run off of uh, volunteers and sponsorships. Um, next slide, please, Andy. Yeah. So that said, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Asbill Corporation, Google, CIG, SensorWorks, Etherdyne Technologies, Bowler Systems, Energis, IoT Nation, Mobile Experts, and Sensatel. And we, if you find this to be of value and you'd like to be part of this uh, organization, we'd love to um, discuss sponsorship with you. So please feel free to contact me at jeremy.toll at wca.org or, or go to our website at wca.org. Next, Andy. And um, for the events, the beyond this this great event today, we're we're going to do one in June that's talking about open Wi-Fi along with the Telecom Infra Project uh, tip. July broadband for underserved rural areas, and in August we'll do IoT applications, um, private equity, and hedge funds. So we'll be getting some people from the investment community and September is a flagship event called IOT Gizmos and Gadgets. Um, we're going to do that in conjunction with an Oktoberfest and if all goes well that will be a, an in-person event that will be hybrid with with a webinar. And then finally for this year um, we're, we have another flagship event what's hot what's not that's um, usually the week before Thanksgiving and that we'll be talking about trends um, for what's hot and what's predictions for the future. And then a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we, we're gonna use the Zoom chat section for questions. Um, we're, we're still learning about uh, real-time comments on, on questions. So we would like prefer to just have you write them in the, in the chat and let us know what you want. And then we'll feed that to Andy and he'll be asking the questions. We're also recording this and the presentations and the recordings will be available 
on the WCA.org website um, within 48 hours. And we'd like to say greetings to the world and thanks for being our guest. We, we're definitely um, excited to have people from all over the world now. And that's one of the um, silver linings of this, this pandemic for the last year that we've been able to reach more people than we have in the past. Well said. Okay. So, and then finally, the thing that you guys all really came here for <laughs> is this, <laughs> this chance to win a bug repellent fan. Um, you must be present at the time of the raffle and we will send the fan directly to the winner. So once your name um, gets called, um, please send a you know private chat message to to me, and and I'll get you uh, get your contact info, and we'll send it to you. So roughly an hour into this presentation, we'll do that, um, and then the presentation will continue, or the Q and A will continue after that. So give people an opportunity to to check that out. It's not it's not wireless per se, but it's wireless wind. So you know, just think of that it's wireless wind, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's portable. It's portable, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for that um, intro, uh, Jeremy. Um, I think sure. we can. Uh, yeah, we can get started yeah, here. Without further ado, Andy Doe from SensorWorks and the WCA. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, um, hello everyone from around the world and and uh, east uh, west coast. Uh, thank you for for coming uh, in your evening uh, for the East Coast folks. Um, today's agenda, we are gonna talk about uh, wearables and wearables, we could talk about all the, what, what a wearable is and so forth, but we're gonna focus a little bit more on smart glasses and AR and VR. So with that, um, you know, uh, it, I had a slide for an introduction in terms of wearables, and this is what I came up with. Uh, this is just me Googling and finding out, you know, the evolution of a wearable. Right. And, uh, you know, there's such a thing as an abacus ring so that you could say that's the first smart ring that was ever invented. I don't know how you can actually do any math with that that little pin. Uh, first radio hat, you know, uh, so you, you know, that was before the, the 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 radio, you know, the portable radio and then the hearing aid and then the pacemaker. Surprisingly, I found this old picture from a company and that was the size of all, uh, basically a, a, an AV cart. So I didn't realize it was that big in 1958. Uh, then of course the evolution of smart wearables uh, from the eighties all the way to the nineties. Uh, I can't see us, anyone wearing that and looking cool. So we're trying to be more cool uh, with the, the invention of the smart glasses from some of the leading uh, tech companies today. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, today we'll be able to talk to the panelists about what it means to, to uh, use and wear uh, a smart wearable and make it cool and, and, and what are the applications out there. And as I mentioned in the abstract, uh, the wearable market is huge. Uh, I, I, you know, I was blown away in terms of uh, what that market potential is. Gartner forecasts about $81 billion in wearables, whether it be smart watches, smart glasses, uh, et cetera, for to be uh, in 2021. And wearables today is not such more, uh, more of a, a, a fashion statement. It is actually a productivity statement. And, and you're going to listen to a lot of these um, uh, speakers talk about how it's being used in business, uh, B2B, almost B2C. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker or give you an um, a, uh, overview of the speakers today. Um, so we have Walt McClay from Volar Systems, uh, who will talk about uh, wearables from a design perspective, and he has a wealth of experience there. Uh, next, we'll talk to uh, Josh Gertz uh, from TeamViewer, who has a con uh, who has the perspective of uh, wearables uh, in terms of the platform. And then, lastly, Tom Harshbarger uh, from Cenex to discuss um, the, the applications uh, and. Uh, uh, talk about Microsoft's initiative uh, into uh, this very, uh, very hot space. So with that, I will hand it over to Walt and do an intro. And before I do that, let me introduce uh, Walt formally. Um, so Walt, uh, president and founder of Strawberry Tree, uh, Volar Systems. Uh, he, uh, they are a top electronic design firm in Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, Volar is particularly experienced in designing wearables and IoT devices. Uh, and particularly in sensors and wireless technology. So with that, Walt, um, did you want to share your screen? And yeah, get to it? thank you very much, Andy. <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce you to several things that will help you with uh, the rest of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, I can, okay, 
So first of all, just to briefly talk about batteries, uh, everybody would like batteries to be smaller and last longer, and they're looking for big changes in the future. And I'm afraid that's not going to be what's happening. They're not changing very fast. If they were, if they changed like semiconductors, you'd have a device the size of a head of a pin that powered your car and cost a cent. And you, you know we're never going to be there. It's, we're limited by what you can store in, in, in the chemical energy. So we're going to be working around those limitations forever. And that means in one area, we're going to be looking at the wireless communication. How do you do wireless communication efficiently? Uh, and there are basically three ways that you get data from a device, a wearable device or an IoT device into the cloud. Uh, some devices go directly to the cloud. Your cell phone does that. Uh, some devices use a gateway, and this is very often Wi-Fi. So you've got a Wi-Fi gateway, it's connected to the cloud, and you just go to Wi-Fi. And it doesn't need as much power as cell, as cell phone. Uh, but a very common way for a wearable device is to go to a mobile phone, which is the gateway. And that very often you're using Bluetooth or Bluetooth LE, which is very, very low in power. So let's take a look at some of the wireless technologies that are available, and they each have their strength and weakness. Uh, we take a look at the, the first four on here. These are all long distance communication intended for low data rates. So LTEM, NB-IoT, Sigfox, and LoRa. Uh, now, when I say low data rates, the first thing you look at is data rate of one megabit per second for LTEM. Well, it can do that, but it's not really useful for that. It's designed for much lower data rates, as are, are the others. And in many cases, you're sending a few hundred bits per second. And what they're really good at is going a long distance at low power. Uh, some of them support audio, some don't. Uh, it's important to understand about public network versus private. Uh, a cell phone uses a public network. You pay to be on the network, but you don't have to install the infrastructure, it's there. You can roam easily. A private network is where you put in a base station and as long as you're near that base station, it works and when you move away, it doesn't, but there's no monthly fee. However, there's an upfront cost. So you'll notice that LoRa is very interesting. It has both. You can put in your own base station or there are, there's a portion of the country that's covered where it's available and you can roam. Uh, the, the big advantage of LTEM and NBIOT is that they now cover well over 90% of the country and they're available in a large part of the world, though notably India and uh, China are lacking, unless that's changed very recently. Uh, so it looks like Sig Sigfox has very low uh, density. It, it, most people don't have it. So being public only, it appears like it's losing out in the race of who becomes the standard. Uh, now, you take a look at these others, Bluetooth LE, that's Bluetooth low energy. Mesh is new, uh, but this is for a small area. You know, if you can go more than 10 meters, you're doing well with Bluetooth or Bluetooth LE. Uh, so it's limited in several ways. Zigbee is a mature uh, capability. It's been around for several decades. Uh, it's used quite a bit, but it's since Zigbee isn't built into cell phones, anytime you want to use a cell phone, it, it's not a good choice. And of course, Wi-Fi and well, whether it's LTE or 5G, it's cellular. Uh, the big advantage there is speed. You know, you can send streaming video on either one of those. Uh, Wi-Fi doesn't go the distance, but it's got less power. So now let's take a look at a comparison of power, distance, and data rate. So across the top of the next chart will be different data rates. Down the side on the left is different distances, and the power consumption will be in each of the blocks. So here, I'm looking at uh, 100, meg 100 bits per second, very slow, 10 kilobits per second, which could just barely handle audio, and above 40 kilobits per second. So even that is fairly slow. 
Uh, and then between a meter, which everybody can handle, and over a kilometer, which only a few can handle. So take a look at the upper left corner, right over here, Bluetooth LE, BLE4, it says, and Zigbee, as well as BLE Mesh, less than a milliwatt. They're the winners in the low power, and that's why Bluetooth LE is so popular, but the distance is very limited. Uh, it won't go 50 meters. The speed is quite limited. It can go at 10 kilobits per second, but not above that. Uh, so there's trade-offs. Standard Bluetooth, uh, you may not be aware, is very different from Bluetooth LE. It consumes a lot more power. Uh, it does go faster. It's designed for audio. Uh, it also is limited in distance. It doesn't appear down here in the 50 meter section. Wi-Fi, of course, uh, quite a bit more power, but it can handle any of these speeds and much more, way, way higher in the megabits. Uh, and Wi-Fi gets you to 50 meters, but it doesn't get you to a kilometer. Now, in the next block, you're seeing LoRa, Sigfox, NB-IoT, LTEM. These have very low power, as long as the data rate's low and the distance is low. Notice what happens when we go to the next block at a longer distance. The power goes up quite a bit. So as you move around, the power is going to change. They're, they're still a lot lower than, uh, let's see, if you look over here, at uh, the next column, yeah, cellular at 200 milliwatts. Uh, LTEM, even L L LTEM and MBIOT at this speed, they're going to be 100 milliwatts. So uh, you've got all kinds of trade offs of power, speed, and data rate. Uh, but what is interesting is that because NBIOT and LTEM now are available almost as much as cellular coverage, I think they're going to become a, the standard when you want a device to connect directly to the internet. Now, let's change and give you a little different background. We're gonna be talking about augmented reality devices, augmented, augmented reality glasses. What's in them? What kind of hardware is in them? Well, they all have a processor and Almost every one of them is designed for video streaming. So it takes a fairly powerful processor. This is not low power. Uh, they have a display, they display on the glasses. Sometimes they'll actually um, display directly on your eye, but most of them display on the lens of the glasses. There's almost always a camera so that you can pick up data or video as well as displaying it. A microphone for Audio is almost always there. Uh, because you're streaming video, it uses Wi-Fi communication. Uh, you know, it, there's nothing that's going to handle that speed that's lower power. And then they often have Bluetooth communication so that you can turn off the Wi-Fi. You may not always be streaming video. And then you've got a much lower communication, much lower power communication, uh, but obviously not good for video. There's frequently a motion chip. Motion chips are inexpensive and, and used for lots of things. For example, you can detect the position of the head and the motion of the head. Uh, it's great for doing a wide, wide view. As you turn your head, you can update the video and it looks like you're in a complete, uh, well, with VR you would do this, but even in AR, it may be helpful to, to understand where you're looking. Gesture recognition is common. Uh, as a, since you don't have a keyboard, how do you communicate with this device? One way is with gesture recognition. Another way, of course, is with voice. And, and then you have a battery. And because these are some power hungry devices, the camera and the microprocessor, the battery needs to be fairly good sized. And there's a significant trade off between how heavy this device is and how long it lasts between charges. Now, before I turn this over to everybody else uh, so you can learn about more about the AR devices, let me just tell you about some interesting wearable devices that I'm familiar with. And of course, AR and VR on your head. 
glucose monitoring there is done with patches. So uh, if anybody has diabetes, you may be using those. They're common now. Sleep monitors are becoming popular. Um, you can, they're used in different places. One is uh, just to monitor your sleep. You can get an app on your phone even that'll do that. But there are devices that you can put on your chest that will monitor your sleep as effectively as going to a sleep lab. But in a sleep lab, your sleep isn't very normal. With these devices, you sleep in your bed very normally and you can do several days worth uh, so they're better than going to a laboratory if you're diagnosing a sleep condition. EEG devices mounted on the head, for example, as a helmet or just as glasses with electrodes. Uh, they can be used for monitoring disease or for games. There's a device that was introduced several years ago where you think and the device moves and you control the speed and the direction of its movement. Hearables. Uh, people have been wearing uh, earbuds for a long time for listening to music. Since they're already there, the, and the ear is a great place to pick up signals from the body, it's now possible to measure heart rate, SpO2, which is oxygen in the blood, and of course motion uh, with a hearable. And these devices can be pretty small, so you can still have audio at the same time. Uh, we developed a leg band that goes around your leg and monitors swelling after a knee replacement surgery uh, so that the doctor can know remotely how the patient is recovering. There are infrared light devices that are supposed to change your mood. I don't know if there's been any double blind studies on these, so there's some uncertainty about how well they work, but apparently they do work. Uh, voltage is used to treat pain. So some of you may have had uh, devices where uh, for, if you've got back pain, they put a, a TENS device, T-E-N-S. Uh, that's fairly old technology, but there are also implanted devices that relieve pain. And in some cases they treat disease. For example, there's one device available that stops tremors and it's just a device you wear on your wrist and you use it several times a day. Uh, there is a device you put on your head that applies the magnetic field that stops migraines. Uh, there are some shirts out and they typically monitor ECG, oxygen, breathing rate, and other parameters. Uh, like the shirt is a convenient place to make these measurements. But uh, if you're running, you may not be wearing a shirt. So there's a pants that will measure your ECG. And measuring the ECG in pants is difficult. The ECG is electrocardiogram, the, the heart signal. Uh, the signal is, is, isn't as strong when you get away from the chest. And to be able to measure it while you're running with dry electrodes is difficult, but we, we came up with an algorithm that worked. And then you, one that you may have seen several times, it's, it's a real popular one, is monitoring glucose in the eye. This is not a real device. It's it's a novelty that, yeah, they can monitor it, but I don't know how well they can convey it wirelessly and how long it works. Uh, it, it's not ready for prime time yet. The Mojo lens is a display that is on contact lenses. And that one, I'm not sure if it's actually a device yet. That's getting into the early stuff. But Sony has a pocket air conditioner. It both heats and cools. You wear it on the back of your neck, which seems to be a very efficient place for making you feel comfortable by changing the temperature. So there's all kinds of wearable devices and it's growing every day. So I'll turn it over to our next speaker now. Hey, thanks for that. Well, <clears throat> yeah, there's, uh, it seems like wearables that, that you've mentioned, uh, the wacky wearables uh, are all touching some sort of the five senses. And I was gonna ask the panelists uh, to think about a wacky wearable. So what's, you know, just to um, kind of tie it onto what you did, what's the wackiest wearable, the, the most absurd uh, wearable that you have seen out there um, that either you have touched design or heard about? Well, asking me, that that's uh, <laughs> what I was just showing you. I, that's the weirdest okay. thing I've seen. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I, I could see you, you've touched pretty every much part of the body. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, 
And our next speaker is Josh Gertz. So Josh, hello, welcome. Hello. Great, we can hear you, thank you. Yeah, so, so Josh um, uh, works for TeamViewer, uh, 25 years in new media, high-tech sales. He is the enterprise account exec for TeamViewer uh, and acquired, uh, formerly uh, the manager, US sales manager for UB Max, which was acquired by TeamViewer. Uh, also a founder of a, uh, uh, in, uh, or an involvement in the mp3.com um, site and business, Neurotic Media and DAQRI, as well as the CEO. Dakri. I see. I knew. I, I knew. I had probably should have said that. <laughs> what my brain was thinking. So Dakri, and CEO of uh, Grids VR. So so Josh, um, I have to say, you know, when I started this uh, this uh, excursion or or this process of learning about AR VR and smart glasses, which I thank my friends at Team Beer for sending me this. Um, you know, I I was not sure what I was getting into, and in, and in terms of you know, the vision uh, thing and having one thing blocked. And, uh, you know, I think the audience would love to hear from you uh, to kind of demystify what is AR, you know, and the difference between VR and, and mixed reality. There's all these, you know, these terms that are, that are thrown around. Can you help clarify what that means to be an AR device and, you know, sure. what smart glasses? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, thank Andy for inviting me to speak today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about uh, wearable devices. And you can't see my desk, but I've got a whole cornucopia of every wearable device known to man, you know, including the ones we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But uh, uh, point being that uh, wearable computing uh, is a methodology of taking uh, generally instructions that you would have been getting in an industrial environment and moving those out of your hands uh, onto something that is wearable. And that could be a head-mounted wearable, could be a wrist-mounted wearable. We see chest-mounted wearables. We see wearables that are mounted on the trolley or the or the forklift. The, the question is, the, the idea being that you, your hands are not occupied by that screen. And then that further drips down into the idea of these are being used for AR. And I, I wanna talk about that for a minute because that term gets thrown around a lot. Uh, the typical term AR, uh, as it is, I guess used long for a long time is augmented reality. And, and what the heck is that? I'm sure most people on this call know this, so I apologize uh, for the basic nature of this, but uh, augmented reality is digital information superimposed on top of the real world. Uh, when, when I got into this business many years ago, the only good example that everybody knew was uh, the yellow line on the football field when you're watching football. Uh, that, that the players don't see that line. That's the TV station or the network imposing that on top of the, the digital image to create an experience for the user. And then a few years ago, luckily, a game called Pokemon Go came around, which if you have kids, as I do, you know Pokemon Go because it was an obsession. And now uh, there are children all over the world holding up their phones in front of fountains and battling dragons. And again, those images aren't real. They're only available on the phone, but the, when you view them, they are actually in place. They are situationally aware. They are on the fountain so that you can have that, that interaction. Augmented reality is an amazing technology, and I know the next speaker is going to talk a lot about it, and it has a tremendous future uh, in a lot of places. But as far as the industrial application of that, it is somewhat limited in today's market based on the amount of devices that are available that make that experience useful in an industrial scenario. So if you look at the Vuzix, Andy, that you showed, or the Realware, or the Google, or the Panasonic, or the Toshiba, I mean, there's, there's so many of these monocular devices out there, they have small screens. And even though it's right in front of your eye, and you have a really good way to view it, and you can see uh, a lot of what's on that screen, um, uh, it is a more challenging environment to then recreate the real world, superimpose digital imagery on top of that, and ask the worker to find the little green square on the little green screen or whatever that may be. Again, in a minute, I know we're going to have a speaker come to talk about a device that is much more capable for these things. Uh, but in our world, we typically use the term AR to mean assisted reality, not augmented. Assisted reality is the concept that you are getting information on demand, usually voice activated, and that information is designed for making your job more efficient, more, uh, less mistakes, whatever, whatever the goal of the program may be. And that technology is very heavily proliferated across industry, even today, much more so than I think the general public is really aware of. 
Uh, there are, again, wearables of all types being used to solve every kind of problem imagined, uh, from picking and logistics to inspections of machines to assembly in the biggest uh, automotive plants in the world to maintenance on every kind of truck part and machine you can possibly imagine. Having the ability to give you information on demand has multiple benefits. First off, um, in a lot of technical careers now, there is an aging workforce. And a lot of my customers, some of the biggest companies in the world, struggle to replace the most senior engineers, repair people, managers in that regard. And having the, the less experienced employee or even the brand new employee have access to the instructions they need to do their job on demand as they need it, uh, anytime without impeding their process by having their hands free is proving to be a very effective training tool. And that may be an unintended consequence of these devices, but we're seeing that uh, as a key factor in the decision making among a lot of the largest companies in the world, because, you know, we, we talk a lot about a term called tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge is the idea that if Bill doesn't come to work today, nobody can fix the radiator because Bill's the only guy who knows how to fix the radiator. Well, that has to be a thing of the past. We have technology available to you that allows you to digitize and synthesize these workflows into a way where anybody can have access to them in a way that makes sense for them, in their language, in their uh, own device, in, their, in a way that they can use very readily. So assisted reality is very proliferated. Wearable technology, very proliferated. But I think we're just still on the cusp when it comes to using augmented reality uh, in the industrial workspace. That, yeah, that, that was a very thorough answer. Uh, thank you there, Josh. So, um, you know, some of the applications uh, that uh, TeamViewer uh, has come across, um, you, you know, what, what, what verticals um, has really been taking off with, with uh, wearables or specifically smart glasses that you've seen in the AR space? Yep, uh, there are a lot. Uh, one of the things that uh, we struggle with is that our technology can be used in so many different ways that we really have to approach the client very holistically and try and find out what problems they're trying to solve. But I'll tell you, there's there's really two that I think are maybe a little bit more advanced. Uh, the first one would be logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, logistics is a very complex part of most big businesses. Uh, I don't care if you're a manufacturer or a distributor or a retailer or what you do. You have a logistics piece to your business. You need to receive items you need or make them or ship them or count them or whatever it may be. And I, this may surprise you, but something like, I, I don't know the actual number, it's like 30% or some, some huge number of warehouses around the world in 2021 are still using pen and paper. Not surprised. Yeah. And, and there's just a long way to come that they, they see now that this technology has become affordable. Uh, it's become something that they can implement rather easily. The journey into AR is much shorter than it used to be. You can prove of concept this for a low amount of money uh, in a very short period of time. So logistics, in order to solve all of those, those repetitive details that happen over and over again, keep people from their brains wandering. You know, one of the issues they have in logistics, if you ask me, to pick the same thing over and over again all day, there's a chance that my brain might miss one of those. And it's not that I don't mean well or I'm not the best employee, it's just the way the human brain works. And having those visual cues in front of you, the picture of the item, the quantity of the item, having to say confirm, having to actually put the process through every time keeps you from making those mistakes. So logistics is definitely one. Yeah. And, and then, just, go ahead. Uh, for please. the second one. Yeah. Yeah. For the second one is definitely remote collaboration or remote mm -hmm. support. So what we're doing right now, you know, Zoom or FaceTime or Skype only designed for the wearable device, the ability for me to see what you're seeing, provide you remote support, um, cut down on the time that we need to fix problems remotely. I think COVID was the big uh, driver there. Suddenly, every maker of every machine everywhere in the world could not go to fix those machines when they broke. Yeah. And now, they, you know, big companies, the biggest auto companies, uh, the biggest retailers are all looking at how can I provide support without actually having to send people there all the time? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I um, basically um, agree with that. This is a productivity tool, and if we all think back about you know the mouse who made it more predict uh, productive in terms of our work, you know, in terms of computers, and then our smartphones made it a little bit more productive. Now I think this is kind of the next evolution of productivity. Um, you know, one of the things that really surprised me. Uh, Josh, was how much uh, voice uh, recognition is in these glasses, you know, because I'm thinking you see things, 
I really did not uh, appreciate the, 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 the workflow rules that uh, Team Beer had implemented in terms of voice. Hey, something's wrong. Okay, call supervisor. You know, that, that was really uh, amazing to, to know that this is really integrated that. Can, can you speak to um, just, uh, you know, applications where, um, uh, you know, it really brings everything together. You got the, the, the remote worker, you got the camera, like there there's, seems like there's four or five different sensor type of things in here. What's the most complex, you know, uh, type of AR solution that you've come across? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Keep it short. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, the, the, I would say the most complex solutions are those that require uh, uh, real-time collaboration and input from people who are very disparate. So you've got people in Europe who bought the machine or, or who made the machine and people in the United States who own the machine and the software provider who's in Colombia who's trying to provide support on this machine and they're all collaborating in real time and each person's having to present their piece of the story in a way that resonates with everyone else remotely. This is not all of us standing in the same room. There are new rules. And so that piece of it becomes very complex. Now, I refuse to do a commercial for what I do. There are softwares that make some of that easier, mine and others. Uh, but the, the key being that that type of collaboration isn't possible even with the software we're using right now. Uh, I can't annotate your screen. I can't pull an image off of something you're doing and modify it and then reshare it. I, we can't be collaborative in this environment. So these tools give us more collaborative tools. That's cool. Yeah, uh, I think uh, when we first met, you showed me some video. I don't know if you if you have yeah, that like available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was really amazing what what was possible. You know, just really blows your mind in uh, terms of what what AR can do and what it should yeah, do. Yeah, let me yeah. let me share my screen. I do want to show two different videos, and then uh, I have a good wacky example I want to show as okay. well. So, uh, Andy, if you could let me know when you yeah, can see my screen, your DHL AR. Yep, we see. Okay, it. so this. This is a uh, DHL facility that they run for uh, Rico copiers. And uh, in this facility, uh, they use the glasses in an entirely uh, voice activated way. You'll see in a moment. Um, this gentleman's pulling a trolley and that trolley has 15 drawers. So that's what's been recreated for him in the glass. Uh, this is all completely voice activated. He says out loud, aisle T1, followed by location 0253, followed by pick two. And at that point, it shows him we should place those location, those items in the box uh, in the trolley, and he places them correspondingly. And right at that moment, he gets the next pick, and he can keep right on moving hands free. Um, when I show this example, I always like to point out a very unintended consequence uh, of this program globally at DHL is that we have cut onboarding time for new employees by 80%. Used to be uh, one full day in the classroom learning how to use the uh, the scan gun and the pick process, and then two full days shadowing before you were allowed to uh, pick a loan. Uh, today, it's uh, four hours learning how to use the glass software, and then you pick on day one. Wow. Okay, so that was a good that was a good example of, of assisted reality. Um, Andy, did you have a comment there? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was frozen. Uh, yeah, it was just uh, amazing that the the amount of um, you know training time you're reducing. And you said you had another yeah. video, yeah. I do, I have, I have one more I'd like sure. to show. Um, I gotta find it, here it is. Um, this is using, not to steal any thunder from upcoming presentations, but uh, this is more of a mixed reality solution. Um, this is uh, an industrial solution using the HoloLens where uh, there are several key advantages to this device. You'll see in this particular workflow, there's a CAD model, a 3D model of the item that she's working on. She's able to pull that model right out and in the same frame, while she's working on that model, she's actually able to make a remote call and get support on that. And that's some of the power of these newer devices uh, that allow us to have all of these advanced functionalities. So she can pull out the model, she can call someone remotely on the same screen and get help, and then that person can guide her through actually making the repair right there uh, in real time. Yeah, it's simply amazing uh, where you know, you, you are truly hands-free and you have so much power at the, the palm of your hands uh, through these glasses. So um, before we move on, I'm going to ask you, what is your wacky wearable? Uh, All right, I got that, one for you. you. So, so this isn't so much a, a wearables, but uh, since I'm focusing here on AR, I, I just absolutely love this. I got to share it with everyone. If you haven't seen this before, 
Uh, this is the uh, aquarium in Tokyo, Japan, and uh, they wanted to uh, drum up some marketing and some attention, and boy, did they ever. Uh, they created an AR app that if you were win, within one kilometer uh, of the uh, of the actual aquarium, uh, you, whoop, AR. Oh, oh my, my, oh here, you can whip out your phone, and uh, they actually digitized a fleet of penguins, and you can follow the penguins from wherever you are all the way to the aquarium. Nice. That is cool. Yeah, it makes going to the aquarium even more fun. That's awesome. right. Yeah, yeah love and it. What's cool is they show you in, second, in this video, they actually brought the penguins into a mocap studio, I mean, the whole bit, and, and actually digitized them. So pretty cool use of AR, if you ask me. That is cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, neat. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Tom Harshbarger there. How, Tom, are you? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, do, doing great, Andy. And thanks for getting the name right this time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll get it one day. Uh, um, but uh, Tom, um, so you, uh, let, let me pull up your bio here, and uh, I may. So Tom, you lead the Microsoft uh, practice uh, for Cenex, uh, Vice President uh, of Microsoft Cloud, Devices, and IoT, and the business units. Um, you also um, have our stakeholder in the uh, company initiatives as it pertains to AI, mixed reality, IoT, and public cloud. You've also led the design, sales, engineering, and development for the Stellar team. So I think, Tom, you've got a pretty good mix of everything from IoT to cloud. And then now you have um, um, smart classes and HoloLens under your umbrella. So with that, um, I wanted to ask of you, since you know, Microsoft uh, and, and HoloLens has been uh, in the news lately, and probably the one, the biggest one that's been been in the news was, um, I, I believe, uh, the U.S. Army announced the contract with HoloLens. Uh, I think it was something like twenty-one billion dollars over a ten-year period for some sort of HoloLens type uh, headset for soldiers. Tell us the story of HoloLens and and how that Microsoft evolution came to be, and maybe share with us some applications. Yeah, sounds great. And thank you very much for having me here. Great to join the, the rest of your speakers and reach the audience. Um, so a little, little story about how HoloLens came to be. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Microsoft's research arm. Um, think about it as a $5 billion a year startup uh, that goes and looks for cool stuff to build. Um, the, the group is amazing. They're researching everything from how to sequence DNA properly to beat cancer at the source, um, to all sorts of technological things. So it, it's, it's both humanitarian and technological. Um, the story of HoloLens begins actually in the year 2000, uh, when Microsoft Research started using uh, video infrared, eventually radar, to develop a device that could see a human. All right, somebody, somebody might be talking off mute there. Um, but uh, uh, started then with, with using those technologies to create a device that could actually capture human movement uh, at the major joints, you know, head, legs, et cetera. 10 years later, uh, Microsoft Xbox Connect hit the market. Um, and that was actually the first public product in that journey uh, towards where we are now, which is, is mixed reality. Um, that eventually led to the first HoloLens, which was a, a great proof of concept and did an amazing job of building neck muscles. Um, and then now has led us to HoloLens 2, which you can see on the screen. And, and just to tie in a few points from the earlier speakers, um, you know, th this is not your eight to 10 hour a day wearable. Um, you know, as, as Walt mentioned, uh, you know, if we strapped a car battery to the back of your head, this thing could run for days, uh, but you might end up having some neck issues. Um, it's not LTE enabled, so you need Wi-Fi. I'll talk about that a little bit more, simply because the power drain on LTE or any other wireless connection is so, so much higher. Um, but what you do have is a high-end computer and a really comfortable headset. Um, with lots and lots of cool stuff to talk about. So I'm going to go ahead and, and launch into it just a little bit. There we go. So I promise not a lot of these slides, but just to give you an idea of, you know, th this is Microsoft Story and Path. It's not dissimilar 
to um, Google, AWS, others as well. There's a lot of agreement about this, but um, intelligent cloud, what does that mean? It means a ton of things, but if we frame it into the mixed reality world, um, what it means is the HoloLens device, the 2D devices that go with it. You can use Google Glass as complement, uh, TeamViewer, all sorts of things. Um, they require uh, connectivity, intelligent edge, and intelligent cloud. And why is that? Uh, there is a lot of real-time processing you can do on HoloLens 2 to identify objects. Um, we built something very similar to the DHL setup here at Cinex for our warehouses to train people to be able to pick pack ship um, day one instead of two weeks of training. Um, so the device can do a bunch of that, but hardcore analytics, managerial decision making, BI, those things, that's not going to happen on your face. And so then you start talking about edge devices. Um, be they wireless routers uh, that have some intelligence on them or, or other devices, you need edge processing for real-time processing and feedback to your devices beyond what the device can do. And then you need some form of public cloud, in, in our case, Azure, that can do the real crunching, the, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, um, decision trees, all that. And so you end up with a device that is very powerful on its own, um, but no way, shape, or form reaches its potential until it has communication, edge compute power, and then back-end compute power. Um, so it makes for a, a really nice cascade of technologies you can introduce to better the experience. And, and for all of us, you know, there's an opportunity to blow away your customer, um, but also you know, create a sales channel for yourself because yeah, we're a distributor, we ship boxes, but my group doesn't ship boxes. Um, we could sell HoloLens all day at 2% margin and think we're doing great, but that's no good, there's no value. Um, so working with the likes of you, wrapping actual solutions around it, uh, and then the whole story out to the public cloud gives us all an opportunity to work with customers for years. Uh, and then just, just a, a visual, given all we've talked about today, um, if you think about augmented reality, virtual reality, so virtual reality is on the right. Um, it's Oculus. It's you're blacked out to the world and, and living in the space in front of you. Really cool applications, not great for walking around a workspace. Um, and then AR, augmented reality is the physical world. Your 2D devices can do that well today. And then HoloLens creeps up into the middle um, on the mixed reality spectrum. So. You're getting a rich display that's augmenting the world in front of you, um, whether it's with information communications, remote assist to repair that pipe that they can't come repair for you, but they can advise you over it. And so you're blending in kind of the, the best of both worlds at either end into a, a single device for it. So that's where that sits on the spectrum. And just a, a few looks at the use cases. So. The picture here itself is awesome. Um, and I don't know if any of you have really good eyes, you can squint over my uh, shoulder here and see some of this stuff going for real. Um, but the, I've worn one of these, the ability to see crisp, true, rich 3D images, charts, real-time feedback on this is absolutely amazing. And some of the top use cases for it, and you know, obviously the Army's gonna use it for everything it's worth, um, but, uh, BMW, Boeing, uh, there's you know, the list of Fortune 100 and now tricky, trickling down into SMB um, that are using these things. So improve skilling. Now, I think uh, both Josh and I have hit on that. Skill people up a lot more quickly and your repair techs, your warehouse workers, um, even you know, your business analysts don't have to be absolute experts all the time um, because they've got the device with them. They can look up anything from a parts manual um, to get somebody on the screen, uh, actually um, marking on their screen to tell them what to do. Put this pipe here, turn that nut there, et cetera. Uh, efficiency, obviously, not just in training, um, but think about the efficiency of having all this here while you're wearing it um, and being able to make real-time decisions as opposed to what's just generally slower. Um, conference calls, 2D screen in front of you with a flat Excel file in front of you. Um, and then first line workers, um, you know, no bigger time than the last 15 months um, for this. The, the use cases um, across healthcare for being able to do face-to-face -face remote diagnosis, 
um, even some site-to-site -site advice during surgery, um, being able to see what each other is seeing and, and so many other things. It's brought a lot more medical care to very sick people and healthy people um, in a way that does not require uh, you know, a very expensive doctor on each and every case. The doctor can scale by helping frontline workers all along the way. So pretty cool uh, stuff. I have a question you know, for yeah. those who um, haven't uh, put on these uh, uh, glasses for the very first time where it's VR, AR, um, you know, how much time does it take to get trained on to get used to that perception? And, and you know, is there such a thing as AR, VR motion sickness? Is, is, you, know, is, you know, what have you seen out there? Yeah, you know, the, the longest straw in the onboarding um, is getting used to the weight on your head. Um, and it's, you know, it's certainly no anvil, no wily e. coyote here. Um, but it is different than putting on a pair of glasses or a hat. So it's getting the headset adjusted so that you're comfortable in your motion. Um, in terms of uptime training, um, it, it is incredibly slow. It uses nothing but natural gestures with your hands, clicking objects, grabbing objects. You can actually type on the screen. And so they're all very fluid motions. Um, we don't have to come up with any, you know, swipe four fingers left and one thumb up and then wink if you want to get to that menu, uh, much more intuitive and, uh, and human friendly there. Very cool. That is Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Uh, and I've talked about most of these already, so I'm not going to read the slide to you, but it just brings a, a little more life to a few of the scenarios we've talked about um, across assistance, collaboration, training, um, and then the, the last one being the contextual data access. I will say a little bit more about that. What's contextual data access? If you really think about it, that makes absolutely no sense. What it actually is, is being able to see your data, your analytics overlaid on your environment. So you want to see in the warehouse, which SKUs are moving the fastest, where you have shortages, great. You can see that visually with colors, charts, et cetera. It's not a spreadsheet where you have to map back to a location. So you can really check out all sorts of hot spots, cold spots, employee performance, machine performance, all that kind of stuff uh, using that kind of contextual data access. That's uh, just a quick picture give you what it looks like up close and personal. And, and it really is amazing version one to version two. Um, so the, the cameras, there are a lot of them, um, not only to orient where you are in space, um, but to give the right kind of feedback based on the right angle. So it's not just a flat display. Uh, you can move around in your context and what you're seeing will move left to right as well as your perspective, um, LIDAR, radar, all that good stuff in there. Um, and then uh, something really cool that is becoming more and more available is uh, the use cases to go with HoloLens. Um, you know, simply having that headset, great. However, lots of different harsh environments. So HoloLens with a hard hat, HoloLens with a full face shield um, for medical. There are just tons of use cases coming out every day, first and third party, that adapt these devices to the customer environment. Um, versus, you know, think, think about somebody working in the field for an electric company, um, having to tiptoe around and adapt to a very fragile $3,000 computer on your face, not well suited. So uh, really making great progress there. And then this talks, what we, we were talking about up at the very front, that the device itself is great, but it is in a community of technology and devices. Um, yeah, everything from your, your phones and tablets to drones uh, to IoT devices, uh, and then on up through the Microsoft technology stack, which is a really open stack, and it lets you take that input and data and then start doing pretty amazing things with it um, and be able to show a real return on investment to your end customer, which is, that's always the magic button for us is, you know, did I get 20 to 1 return on the $3,000 or $10,000? Right. right. We can prove it to the bottom line, you're in great shape. required billboard of big customer names. Um, so lots of automotive, aerospace, manufacturing, oil, gas, health, and public sector. Um, list gets longer every day. And while these slides always focus on the names, hopefully everybody recognizes around the world, 
um, the names that you absolutely would not recognize unless you lived in Greenville, South Carolina or some other location uh, is growing daily. Um, we've had a lot of success with uh, auto body shops, you know, small chains, um, things of that nature where they can use this device to get real-time feedback information, user manuals, making their skilled frontline workers even more efficient because they're not trolling through all the paper volumes and things that they traditionally do. Wonderful. Th thank you for that, Tom. Yeah, that was uh, very educational, you know, taking us through kind of the story and and uh, some of the um, uh, the features in the Hololens too. Uh, you mentioned you you know you saw you had a slide of the big boys there, you know the, the big brands, but you know with the price point being this three thousand um, dollar you know computer on your head, um, uh, you know what are those the auto you know what's the return on investment with the the smaller customers. Or for them that they feel it's worth it to have that three thousand dollar, like you know, can it can it is the ROI worth it for a, a company with ten people? You know, uh, where, where where can that come into play? Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a great question, and it's a tough sell in that market because with ten thousand people, and you know, let's say you spend eight grand for the headset, the software, and the deployment services, I mean that can be an entire quarter marketing budget or bonus budget. So. Right. Um, Cautious is the way we approach all of those, um, simply because the last thing in the world you want to do is have an awesome use case, and when people go to check the customer out, they're no longer there. Right. Um, so, but where where you do see a lot of return, um, really across the services type industry. So, whether it is automobile automobile manufacturing, some other kind of mom and pop. Um, the ability not just to get the device, but then to connect it into the back end systems. Um, the ROI there is, is tremendous when used properly. And, and I'll give you just a, a couple of examples. These will be a little bit repetitive, um, but a little more specific. That you know, let's let's take the the local plumber. Um, you have the the cost of employing master plumbers much higher than employing apprentices, etc. Um, and you know, while they, you never want to shortchange your customer on the quality they're getting, the ability for that agency to have five people who are interning, who are on their way to be master plumbers, out solving difficult problems because they can have a 30 second real time chat where their support is looking directly at the issue they're having. I mean, that that's life changing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's send a more senior tech out, send pictures over your phone, which hit or miss, it might take you one or 10 shots to get it. Um, and so just that kind of scale for the business in terms of a return on investment for dollars. Now, we say you, you can probably increase your capacity to deliver by about 33% just baseline before you start getting crazy. And for a small business, you know, 10,000 bucks against earning 33% more per month, um, and it's important that that ROI story stays 90 days or less, because when yeah. you start looking further out, you know, project failure, loss of interest, all those things creep in as a small business owner, as, as they would to my head. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying, you know, uh, uh, to get good at anything, you have to spend 10,000 hours, right, to get good at anything. So it seems like these smart glasses and uh, are really at least maybe buying you 3,000 hours <laughs> worth of expertise, you know, so you're not a super expert, but uh, takes you, you know, a third of the way. So um, yeah. we're, we're, we're near the top of the hour, and uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I also see a lot of questions in the chat, so uh, thank you uh, to the audience, and uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to go through all of them, but uh, some of them are, uh, I guess, really very relevant, and I'll, I'll kind of cherry pick that um, yeah. Hey, Andy. You, Panelist. You forgot my wacky. You yes. forgot my wacky wearable keyboard. Oh, your wacky wearable. Into... Sorry. Yes. What is your wacky wearable? Tell it's us. Key keyboards built into your pants. Oh. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's. Yep. Uh, I don't. I can't see that being comfortable. <laughs> no. Th there were some major issues that uh, caused these to not take off, but be taken off. <laughs> I don't know how you found that, uh, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna Amazon that and see, see and let you know. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. So so again, top of the hour. Um, I know we do have a raffle, and then we have a lot of questions. So uh, to the speakers, um, 
uh, I, I can, rather than just do a panelist, I'm just going to cherry pick some questions from uh, the, the chat. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the questions, uh, and to, to Walt, for example, there was a question earlier about how do people feel about having, you know, a, a, a radio uh, near their head? And, and, you know, you mentioned Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, still a radio uh, of some sorts, and, and now potentially talking about cellular. Are there any concerns there? Uh, to to uh, have such a uh, emitter in your head. Yes. Uh, so there are. When it comes to something like cellular, there are actually regulations for how much energy is absorbed by the head, uh, and it's significant enough that there's concern. It's still not completely proven just how big an issue it is. But then there are some people that are worried about signals as small as Bluetooth LE. And you saw that the power difference was about a thousand to one. Uh, so some people are worried about things they shouldn't be, but it's not an issue that is without concern. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I mean, the, you know, we've had Bluetooth headsets for the longest time, right? So uh, certainly um, uh, different technologies. You have a, what is it, SARS uh, test, I believe. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. To to get past that. Um, yeah. And there's uh, some other questions here. Um, uh, uh, I, I, there was uh, questions about, uh, let me see if I could find, uh, someone had mentioned, how does the upcoming Wi-Fi 6 standard come into play with AR, VR, the additional bandwidth available is tremendous, seems to be a good fit. So would Wi-Fi, and this is to all the panelists, would Wi-Fi 6 be kind of the answer uh, to um, truly making it an AR, VR, um, you know, um, uh, the device that that could really do everything in, in real time. I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, so I can tell you that in the industrial world, in these giant factories, uh, almost all of them experience dead spots on their Wi-Fi, no matter what they do. And 5G, WiMAX, uh, Wi-Fi 6, and WiMAX are definitely solutions that big industry is counting on to make the coverage in their buildings, these 5 million square foot factories and up uh, better. So we're very much looking forward to that. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we'll we'll have uh, one more question here. Um, uh, a lot of love comments for a great presentation, everyone. Um, let me see if I could find something that is unrelated to power. A lot of power questions. Um, uh, so a question, I guess, to back to you, Walt. Here it says: uh, Do headset glasses design rules include some sort of directional shielding between the wearable and the head? Uh, well, I presume we're talking about electromagnetic shielding, which is the issue of how much energy is absorbed by the head. And, you know, having something heating my brain is something that does concern me. And there have been, so uh, there's not much shielding because we're not dealing with cellular signals. Wi Fi, as far as I know, doesn't have a requirement for minimizing the absorption, it, it may have. Uh, and certainly there, there's nothing with Bluetooth. Uh, so the, you're getting something in your head. Uh, and, you know, there have been lots of studies in this area, and there isn't a consensus on exactly how much of a problem it is. Part of the problem is that many of the studies were done by companies that had a, a stake in this industry. We'll leave it at that. I like this question a lot, um, and uh, I think to the, uh, the smart glass folks, um, are these device, devices potential vectors for cyber attack, or do they have some sort of defense built in? So attacking your glass and controlling your head. <laughs> um, well, they, they, even though, with the exception of the HoloLens, um, they're, they're mostly Android tablets, so they, they would be as vulnerable or you know, the same as any other Android tablet on the market. Okay. Yeah, there, there are definitely ways to exploit Android if you're not careful. And uh, that's where I think a lot of our MDM partners come in to, to manage some of that. And, you know, you're, you need a sharp IT team, but uh, it's not something that we face to date, but at the same time, it's a real concern. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, so, you yeah. know, Never will I say any device is impermeable. Um, having, having said that, though, um, a few things on HL2. So um, it's not running 
windows. So your normal windows attack vectors aren't there. Um, it, uh, as, as Josh just mentioned around device management, um, it runs uh, Intune or actually autopilot on all of them. Um, so instant wipe and reset without IT is available should you detect any breach. And then the entire Surface family, um, security starts at the actual chip before power up um, and goes all the way out to the cloud. Uh, so uh, in terms of concerns about those devices, um, we don't have much, but you're always one headline away from having a newfound concern. Not, nothing out there is bulletproof, clearly. Right, right. That's good to me. Yeah. Sorry, I've got a comment on this. But did you have a comment before? No, I... please. No, I'd love to hear it. So we've developed lots of wearable devices. And when it comes to consumer products, there's not a lot of concern about security, particularly with a startup, because they have a choice of getting it to market fast or spending extra time and money and making it more secure. And when you go to buy something in a store, do you make a choice based on security? And, and if you, it is secure, how do you improve it? Now, in the case of medical devices, it's a different story. The FDA has some recommended uh, security uh, measures. And when they recommend something, if you don't follow it, you're going to have a little bit of an issue. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's becoming standard. And then with large medical device companies, there have been enough stories that they're getting paranoid about security. So the security is changing, and I think it will eventually affect consumer products. For example, the, the government, U.S. government now requires a certain level of security on devices that they're buying, or it's going into effect soon. Uh, that will affect everything. Great, thank you. Well, uh, I know some of you are anxious to get a raffle for the, um, uh, the fan, uh, so I wanna make sure we can do that. Uh, and uh, if uh, some of you want to leave uh, um, after this, and we can certainly continue as more questions come in. So uh, Jeremy, if you're still there, if you uh, can help us with the random raffle. I uh, am, there. I just did a random uh, draw and do it. Okay. Winner is drum roll, um, Marissa Hernandez. So Marissa, congratulations. congratulations! If you're still, I looks like you're still on. So if you could just shoot me a quick uh, um, chat with your contact or email or your address, um, then we can we can get that out to you as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you, Marissa. Yeah, and send us a shot of it when you get it. Yeah. Up to yeah, see you send, using send it. Send a picture of it in <laughs> use and. We can we can post that right. So um, just to finish up, uh, and if there's any more uh, questions, um, you know, for the, the panelists, uh, last last couple of questions here. Um, right now, you know, uh, we're just getting used to buying a thousand dollar smartphone, right? Some of us are, and some of us aren't, but <laughs> that's what that's the going rate these days for a high end smartphone. Um, what do you think it will take, whether it be price or 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 just um, application to to get these uh, smart glasses mainstream, um, and and you know there, there is the famous story of Google Glasses trying to go mainstream, and that didn't happen for numerous reasons. Privacy is was one of them. Um, Tom, I'll start with you. Uh, what do you think it's going to take? Sure. So a um, couple things: you know, evolution of technology for sure. Like anything, the, you know, this three thousand dollar Hololens, this two thousand dollar that. In a couple of years, this device will be a thousand dollars, and its big brother and sister will be around. Um, so I think normal evolution of cost of technology uh, probably going to be a bit delayed here, since producing anything right now around the world is a bit of a nightmare. Um, so that that's one part of it, um, and then I think the the second part is um, intelligently building more, uh, I guess, more specific feature sets. Um, HoloLens now, flagship product, top end, it can do everything that a HoloLens can do. Mm. Uh, while the adaptability to different work environments, different headpieces, et cetera, is great. Um, having more specialized devices for certain industries with a, maybe a smaller set of capabilities to make them uh, more affordable and a quicker path to ROI is important. And I'm, I'm gonna throw in a third one as well. Um, the continued maturation of the technology around these glasses 
that support and extend it. So your tablet, your phone, the cloud, all these other pieces that don't require three to five thousand dollars every time you want someone to put something on their head. Yeah, I, I, I would concur. Um, how about you, Josh? What do you think is going to take it to make this mainstream? I'm going to respectfully disagree with Tom and say that all those things are important. I'm not knocking any of them, but glasses <laughs> are a personal expression. And until they make fashionable glasses that I can put on and feel really good about wearing, and they come in enough different looks and feels for me to feel fashionable wearing them, it's not going to succeed. I, I think Apple is going to come out with a device in the next 12 months that will have three or four different frames and lens sizes. And until somebody cracks that nut and makes it a fashion statement to wear these, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's going to hit the consumer market. If you're going with the cool factor, uh, and I've, I've looked online, they're saying that those glasses might come out at $500, $500 or so, maybe a little bit more. We don't know yet. Right? Apple, customers, Apple customers don't care. Yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> right. It's Apple. So yeah, they, they've got the whole ecosystem. So yeah, that that would uh, would uh, certainly uh, uh, be important to see if uh, that's going to stick. Um, how about you, Walt? Uh, you know, mainstream question. Uh, mainstream being, you know, you'll you'll see more of it every day. Well, you know, I think that we're already seeing the mainstream for business use. Mm -hmm. That's we've just seen software that really makes them useful and really saves money. And this is what we need. I think what's been holding it back for business use is the applications and, and we're, we're, we're getting them. So yeah. that's happening. Now, for a device that costs more than $1,000, it's really hard to have that become a consumer product. That's been a major problem. And there's also been the lack of applications. So uh, we'll see. It, Apple could change it. They've done that in the past. We'll, we'll see what happens. And my my uh, ability to foresee the future isn't so good. Yeah, yeah. No, from a, from an industrial, uh, I think, uh, uh, a, a point of view, uh, Industry 4.0, I mean, that's definitely where it's going. And I could see a day where every uh, logistic factory worker has one of these, uh, whether it be the full-blown, you know, HoloLens or kind of a smart glass. Um, There's a comment here in, in the chat, based on calculated savings, HoloLens can get people to pay for the lens via savings. Upfront capital will not allow smaller users to justify capital expenses. So kind of uh, 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 highlighting uh, what you guys have said uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, smaller users will, will have to justify it. So with that, um, uh, does anyone else have any other comments? Uh, you are you're welcome to um, uh, chime in and, and raise your hand. Uh, but uh, uh, if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank our our wonderful panelists uh, to share their views on, on wearables, smart glasses, hollow lens. Uh, I've learned some things being here and I hope you guys have too. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanna close out and uh, Jeremy, I don't know if we have any uh, closing slides. Let me see here. Um, I, think, I think maybe just, just oh, I some contact yeah. info. Yeah, right. So with that, um, uh, please join us uh, for our next event at the WCA.org. Uh, we are a nonprofit, uh, and we do uh, work on sponsorship as well as donations. So if you have uh, any interest there, please do contact us. And the Wireless Communication Alliance, one of the oldest wireless SIGs in the country uh, since the 90s, uh, we are continuing on. And, and our charter uh, is to you know expand technology. And with the IoT applications, we're going to use uh, that uh, interest to tie into wireless. So thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, panelists. And uh, we'll have this recording in about 48 hours for you to review.